You all see the PowerPoint, correct? Perfect. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to wait just a couple minutes as people start entering, and then we'll go ahead and uh, get started. But again, thanks for being here today. All right, I'm gonna give it one more minute. Actually, while we wait for us to get started, um, just a heads up, I know that we all, um, you can see the panelists, um, but you aren't seeing the webinar participants. That said, this is going to still be a very interactive webinar. We are going to be using the chat pretty often during this. So um, before we get started, if anybody is uh, open and willing, please take a moment to say hi in the chat, just to know that you are here and ready to, be engaged with us for this um, fun hour together. Amazing. I think we have somebody from California. Um, all of us on the panel, we're all from all different states. So, oh, got Texas. We have two California. All right. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today for a really special webinar that is in partnership with RDLA, the Rare Disease Legislative Advocates and Rare Artists. Um, we are excited to be talking about poetry today, which if you are a Rare Artist fan, you know that we recently announced that poetry will be a new accepted medium for the 2023 uh, contest. Just some uh, general housekeeping items. If you prefer to call into today's webinar, you can do so. The phone number is listed on the screen as well as the webinar ID. If you would like to ask a question, please type it in the Q&A box and one of our panelists will make sure that we address your question. You're also welcome to use the chat at any time. As I said, we're keeping this really fun and interactive for all of you. If there is any um, members of the media here, we ask that you formally announce your participation and refrain from quoting the discussion um, during the webinar. And we encourage you to follow up with participants after the webinar for direct quotes. Closed captioning is available um, in the meeting. You can click live transcript at the bottom of your window to begin. And we also have the uh, capability to have Spanish translations uh, as well. And Caitlin is going to go ahead and put that in the chat as well. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and jump in. We have a group of four amazing panelists today. Um, starting with Dr. Carl Barnes, who is an advocate himself from Colorado. Dr. Barnes is a physician and also has a, an amazing knowledge of narrative medicine, so we'll hear a lot from him. Abby Hauser is a uh, YAR member and also a board member for the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. Abby also has a not so secret and hidden talent of being a writer. So Abby has joined us today to be able to share um, more about their experience. Uh, Caitlin Laws is a staff member with the um, Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases and is our manager for our RDLA. And then I am Stephanie. I am the associate director of uh, patient programs, and I manage the rare artist program. So I see a lot of our 
social media fans on here are rare artists social media so i'm the one that runs our our instagram so excited to see some familiar names on here um today we are going to be diving in right away we're going to be talking about rare artists in 2023 and then i'm going to pass it over to abby who is going to talk a little bit about what poetry is and share some examples the really deep dive part of this webinar is going to be done by Dr. Barnes, who is going to talk about narrative medicine and poetry. And like I said, Dr. Barnes has some really exciting opportunities for you to be able to participate and uh, share and practice some poetry as well. And then Caitlin is going to wrap us up with some upcoming opportunities to really take this uh, opportunity and share it um, with your advocacy efforts. All right, let's go ahead and dive in. So Rare Artist uh, 2023, um, my panelists, if you could keep a member on, uh, if you could keep a an eye on the chat, I'm curious how many of you, the attendees have entered Rare Artist before? If you just wanna pop in the chat and say, I have, or if you're just a fan and you are you know, engaged on our social media, um, I'm happy that you're here as well. Got some fans, got the people that have entered. Amazing. Well, this year, uh, save the date. It is in my calendar in all caps. Very excited that submissions will start to be accepted starting July 21st, and they will be accepted from July 20, I'm sorry, July 23rd until August 31st. We are using the same submissions platform, that Rare Artist Awards platform, as we have in the past couple of years. Uh, as you have probably heard, and if not, this is going to be a new for you, poetry is a new medium for 2023. We'll hear from Abby in just a moment about what poetry is, but keep in mind it's a very broad medium. It can include song lyrics, rhymes, and be free verse. It's really up to you. Today we'll talk about some things to inspire your pro poems, but poems can include anything that you want to write about. Judges in particular are looking for pieces that connect to the rare disease space and share the importance of rare disease advocacy. So with that in mind, when you are working on your poems, think about your diagnostic journey, your advocacy experience, uh, diversity and inclusion efforts in the rare disease space, and again, really focus on your own story of what's important to you. For the entry rules and guidelines, poems, just like any other entry, they must be uploaded as a file into the Rare Artist platform. You can enter it as an image, so a JPEG or a PNG, a Word document or a PDF file. This is really to ensure that your files um, are properly formatted with the lines. And if you have any illustrations or design elements, those are welcome to be included, but of course are not required. If you are interested in submitting poems, poem entries for the contest must be 200 words or less. And artists are still required to submit an artist statement along with their poem. So that's that little description explaining the program, uh, the poem. So if you go to a museum and you see an art piece, usually there's a plaque next to the art piece that explains it. That's exactly what an artist statement is. When you're working on your artist statement, whether you're entering for poetry or a visual piece, really consider the thought, the feeling, and your experience behind the poem. So what do you hope that poem really makes that reader feel and think about? Some of you have wondered and reached out already uh, wondering how awards will work. So awards will be continued to be awarded by age range which, with at least one awardee per age court category. So children, teen, young adults and adults, but the number of awardees per art medium is not predetermined. So um, we will have not determined how many poetry awardees it will be versus visual arts. Again, it's really based on the age ranges. For a more complete list of guidelines, please visit rareartist.org. And some of you have experience with this, um, but we're gonna talk a little bit about how can you use rare artists. 
um, and your art in advocacy. So this is something especially to be thinking about during this webinar today and as you're working on your artist pieces. Um, there are some phenomenal examples on the screen that I'll talk about in just a second. But before we get there, I want you all to take a second. You're welcome to just sit back, close your eyes if that's easier. Think about a time where um, you were navigating a really difficult aspect of your rare disease or when you first got diagnosed with your rare disease. Maybe there was a time where you couldn't get access to a medication that you really needed. If you're a caregiver, maybe you experienced something similar for somebody that you were really close to. How did that make you feel? So often when we think about these things and we talk about our medical journeys, we hear really big words when it comes to our rare diseases. Um, feel free to enter in the chat. I'm curious, how many of you have a rare disease that is difficult to pronounce? You know way more about a medical procedure or a medication than you've ever thought of. And you know some really big medical terminology now. I see some people saying yes in the chat. So when we tell people our stories, oftentimes those big words come with it. Some people have made, I may have heard the terms medical jargon. So it can be difficult to tell your story to someone who may not understand all that medical jargon. And that's where art really comes in handy. It's a way to be able to tell your story and be able to process and understand our emotions, our experience on a more personal and emotional level. Um, some people say a picture is worth a thousand words and that directly translates into our journeys um, and will directly translate into poetry as well. So your art is really a way for you to comprehend your own story, to tell it to others and to advocate for a change. Oftentimes those art pieces are so memorable. So um, looking at the pictures on your screen right now in the middle is anybody, anybody recognize a senator on the screen in the middle? See who can guess it first in the chat. Put your guesses in the chat. Yes, it's Senator Elizabeth Warren from Massachusetts. So um, Senator Warren is with Laura Romano, who is one of our 2022 Rare Artist Awardees. Um, Senator Warren found out about Laura's piece, um, which we'll talk about, we'll show you in a, in a few minutes, but so, uh, uh, Senator Warren was so inspired by um, Laura's piece that Senator Warren made sure that she was actually there to meet with Laura and afterwards said, can you send me your art piece to be able to hang in my office? So there's actually a rare artist piece hanging up in Elizabeth Warren's office, which is very cool. Very similar, moving on to the right side of the screen is one of our rare artists from Alaska um, who is meeting with an Alaska Senator. And this Senator, Senator Murkowski, uh, received an award, one of our Rare Voice Awards. And so Sarah, who is a rare artist, went to meet with Senator Murkowski during Rare Disease Week. And Senator Murkowski was like, wait, I know you and I know your story because of that art piece that had a memorable experience. And then on the far left side of the screen, this may be familiar for you if you attended Rare Disease Week. This is Wes, who was a Rare Artist awardee this year. Um, Wes, was a uh, the artist for the painting Sprout. And you can see Wes wore his shirt um, with his painting on it and also had it on display. So when he went to his meetings with his legislators, he was wearing like a blazer like I am, but had his shirt on underneath it. So was able to reference it. So with all that in mind, there are lots of ways that you can use art to advocate. We'll talk more about that today and how you can use art and poetry when you're advocating and especially meeting with legislators and we'll learn about another opportunity to have that in just a moment. All right, Abby, I'm gonna pass it along to you. All right, so this, when Stephanie said that this was the title of my slide, I was like, this is kind of a big topic. Didn't really know where to start, but I, I know that Carl is going to go into more of like specific types of poems and like the actual structure of poetry. So I thought I'd go into more like what poetry means for me as a writer and what I end up using poetry for in terms of storytelling. 
and how I view it um, as a, a way to get complex ideas into writing that I can't put into other forms. But as I was looking this up, I actually sent this article that I found to Carl and Stephanie, um, and it's called Saying the Unsayable, the Psychology of Poetry. And just that phrase alone, saying the unsayable, I think sums up what poetry is able to do because you can get so much of this complex emotion that kind of sits around in your head that you can't figure out a way to share with others without using metaphor or complex language. And you're able to put it into words. But then there was this whole sort of paragraph within this article that related poets to being, to like medicine and be, almost like pharmacists. So I pulled out this quote because I feel like this really fits with how we should view poetry when we're sharing stories in our rare community. Um, and it says, poets enjoy an intimate acquaintance with the medicinal shelves of language. They tinker with doses, stir flasks, and study the tastes and textures of the elements so that when their words are drunk by others, they are as precise and truthful as they are potent. And that alone, I think is, I think we've all read a poem that has really resonated with us at one point in time or another. Uh, and you know that feeling, it's hard to describe when you read something that someone has described that fits your experience so well. But that is when you know that those words have become that precise and potent story that you wanna tell. And it's short and it's to the point. And those are the things that we use in advocacy when we go to meet with lawmakers or we're meeting in doctor's offices, we're trying to get our points across very concisely, but also in a powerful way. So for me, I view poetry as a looser form to tell a story. I tend to just do like free verse poetry. I don't have any formal training in any way. So it's for me, it's less structured. And then I'm able to get these complex emotions onto page that I might not otherwise know how to figure out. Um, a poem that I recently shared online was about um, having, it was this a complex idea that I had about having this one scar that I have that has been um, cut open multiple times. I've had surgery on the same exact spot like three times now. And that's what I was like, there's something there. There's a story that I wanted to tell about what it's like to have the same spot cut open again. And it, the stories, there was just like something there that I could not figure out. And I tried for weeks to write a paragraph. I tried to write a post and nothing was working. So I just turned to poetry and sort of let the structure a little bit looser, tried to keep those metaphors strong. And that's when I ended up with a poem that I really liked and actually got the point that I was trying to get across so much better than if I would have tried to just ramble on for paragraphs. But um, on this next slide that I have is a, a personal example of a poem that I wrote. It's not for this rare artist at all, but this uh, background with this one is uh, a friend of mine that has a rare disease had written um, a text to me about an appointment that had gone poorly, uh, something that I think we can all relate to. And they were told by a provider that their symptoms weren't that bad in the grand scheme of everything else of their disease. And something about that phrase just stuck with me and I, I got mad and I didn't like that they were having to deal with this. So as a writer, anyone that's friends with me, I think knows that I've sent them something that I've written at one point or another or a very long text uh, using my words to help um, with their journey. But on this day, I couldn't figure out a way to figure, put that into better language. So I turned to poetry and I, I sent it to her eventually, but um, this poem, I'll read it out loud. It's 168 words, which would fit into our rare artist submission. But um, you'll see at the end of this that you'll see that there's a little bit of a way that I can see that I could turn this into something that I could advocate with as well. But the poem is called For Chris. You're told it's not that bad, but they don't know what it's like to live inside your body. You're told it's not that bad when they have no answers and the research can't help. You're told it's not that bad as you sit there, pain radiating throughout your body, ignored by those meant to help. You're told it's not that bad and I want to scream, but I'll settle for telling you what they should have all along. Listen closely, your pain is valid, your symptoms are real, and you deserve care. I see you facing each day with the memories of yesterday's pain added to the new pain of today, still finding ways to smile. I am in awe of your strength and yet wish you didn't need it. 
You're told it's not that bad, but do not listen. Your scars tell stories of battles won and some still being fought. One phrase cannot diminish all that you are and all you deserve to receive. Healthcare is broken. So I wrote that one um, and sent it to my friend because I was able to convey this complex idea of what I wanted to reassure her and what I wanted to tell her. And that just was not working in a text. It wasn't working in a paragraph. Nothing was working to get this story across and poetry was able to fill that void. And now with this rare artist connecting it to advocacy, I can see ways that you could bring a poem like this to show how a typical appointment might go for us um, or the things that if you're advocating for better healthcare access or things, uh, better understanding and research like that. Um, there's just a lot of ways that a poem like this that doesn't seem like it could directly connects to advocacy, I can see connecting now as we go on into something that I could easily advocate with. So it doesn't have to be something that you sit down and immediately go, I want to just advocate with this poem. It can be a poem that you've already written and now you can find a way to share that story with it. So for me, that's what poetry is. And Carl's gonna get really into the, like the, the details of how we can do couplets and haikus in different forms. Um, but I just wanted to reassure you that as a non like trained writer or non-professional poet in any means that there are lots of ways that you can still turn to poetry and enter this uh, contest and participation and get that advocacy across. Now am I on? Can everyone hear? All right. Again, I'm Carl Barnes, my physician. I have background in uh, research. Uh, I am also have completed a graduate certificate in bioethics and health humanities at the University of uh, Colorado Center for uh, uh, Ethics and uh, Humanities. So I have a lot, bring a lot to, there I am. All right. I, was, I, I saw Abby and now I see myself. Okay. So today we are going to uh, the topic on our first slide, the narrative of rare. And Abby and her very beautiful and powerful uh, poem certainly uh, told us and exhibited many of the things that we're going to be talking about today and how uh, art can be used in advocacy, but um, thinking about art as advocacy and uh, for yourself and to get that message. And that's how we can help augment our uh, advocacy uh, process by incorporating art to, as I say, hit the heart, mind, and soul of our legislators and their assistants and aides. And as a quick example, um, when I was at Rare, Rare Disease uh, Week, I had, as many who attended probably remember that uh, the uh, first medication for, or treatment for Friedrich's ataxia was approved on Rare Disease Day. So we really got that uh, approval and it was achieved through an expedited process that in incorporated patient experience data, which is what the Benefit Act was about. So I happen to have, uh, and we'll at the end talk about a rare artist, uh, Sophia Sieber Davis, who I believe was two years ago, um, not this year, but she was one of the rare artist uh, uh, awardees. And I happen to have both her beautiful uh, painting, but also her statement, that uh, artist statement that really helped put the Benefit Act patient experience data, the FDA approval process, and multitude of things. And it really, I felt, helped uh, the, the process and the uh, my particular elevator pitch for that. So I actually brought someone else's, a rare artist's 
work into the Capitol uh, Hill meeting. So let's get in. We want to get into have you write some poetry we're going to do. I've chosen uh, to start or early on, we're going to do some haikus and some couplets, and then we're going to expand on that. But the reason for that is to put kind of small uh, works into uh, the chat box. But before we do that, we have to kind of explain what narrative medicine is and the processes. So narrative medicine really incorporates the humanities and the arts, along with clinical practice and uh, healthcare justice ethics processes into exploring patient stories to enhance the listening and observation skills to those within the healthcare community. As we're thinking of uh, what's at, when Abby and her poem uh, noted a lot of the disconnect between patients and the healthcare system about listening and observing and not feeling that you're uh, heard or that your story is really being taken in. So narrative medicine is a way for us to connect uh, better with uh, patients. One thing about narrative medicine is there's not a lot of debate about where it began and where who developed it. It began in 2001 at uh, Columbia University's uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons. And the originator is pictured here, Dr. Dr. Rita uh, Sharon, who's a physician with a background in humanities and literature and so forth. And so I like her quote of narrative medicine is a commitment to understanding patients' lives, caring for the caregivers. That's very important. We're focusing on the disease and patients. We got to remember uh, that the caregivers have ov overlapping uh, issues, stress, suffering with the patient, but there's somewhat unique aspects of uh, the caregivers and family and friends. And then giving voice to the suffering uh, is what Dr. Sharon closes in that. So I think that's a good place to start. So if I may have the next slide, please. So some words to know. Uh, what we're trying to achieve is what we call narrative competency, which is the ability to acknowledge, absorb, interpret, and act on the stories and plights of others. And we achieve this through uh, three aspects of attention, representation, and affiliation. With attention, that's the combining a mindfulness, a contribution of the self, I, the physician. I need to invest myself and to contribute. I say that, use that overused term of deeper dive into the patient interaction. To use a, acute observation, attuned concentration to capture another's usually the patient's perspective. Representation, and this is where I'm gonna reference Abby's poem that I just heard for the, read and heard for the first time, making audible and visible that, that which would otherwise pass unnoted. And I wrote, typed Abby, um, saying the unsayable is uh, what Abby uh, stated. And that is really representation. The patient saying the unsable and me, the physician or a researcher or the FDA or our legislators saying the uh, unsable. I just lost the slide in front of me. We still have a shared screen, but I can continue. I don't know if I touched anything. Um, There we go. All right, now we're back. Thank you, thank you. I uh, do have backups if uh, needed. And then affiliate. The ultimate goal is affiliation, where we make that you know e empathy, empathetic connection between seemingly disparate entities that can be uh, patient physician, which really shouldn't be a disparate entities. But as Abby alluded to in her poem, there is a lot of disconnect and distrust with the healthcare. Healthcare is broken is what she said. And that involves um, the connections between patient healthcare, patient science research. We, all of us, society with our FDA and our legislators through advocacy. So those three terms I'm gonna to return to attention, representation, affiliation. 
Um, the ap applicability of rare disease, uh, we just, and I do, or had done research in my background, is some posters on a disease called arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, or ARVC, uh, that I uh, worked on. And we just last week had our first, what was called externally linked patient focus uh, drug development session, kind of that share your story. And we had over, as of this uh, today or yesterday, 100 submissions from patients with a rare disease. So the importance of patient advocacy groups to get those stories and narratives. But we want to, as we proceed with uh, developing the uh, patient testimonial page and condensing this stuff, that we maintain that narrative competency. Are we getting the full picture, the full story? Three terms that we want to use or make sure that we're that are often used uh, interchangeable disease illness disease is that pathologic process that deviates from biologic norms and a lot of our rare disease community until you get that diagnosis do you really have the disease yes you do that process is going on but it's not known to either the patient or the physician or the researchers so you Technically, um, and people argue back and forth about these terms, is that do you really have disease uh, until you get the diagnosis? But what you definitely have is illness. And that's what we call the lived experience of the ill health. Um, as they say, sometimes when no disease or diagnosis uh, is found. So just because you don't have that diagnosis doesn't mean you're ill. And when you lack that clarity, the diagnosis, the what's known about a disease that contributes to suffering, which is really that multi-dimensional process that involve, can involve pain, both physical, emotional pain, distress, hardship, that really leads to an experience of a threat of damage to personhood. So we are going to use these terms. So if we can go to the next slide, please. All right. In narrative in medicine, uh, the process that we use in narrative medicine is to start from a point of a text, literature, art, uh, poetry, and then to reflect. We'll go through these process of close reading and reflecting on a piece of uh, text or visual art or audible art music. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, a piece of literature called The Wounded Storyteller, The Wounded Storyteller, Body, Illness, and Ethics by Arthur W. Frank from 1995. This was six years before the technical onset of narrative medicine. And a nice quote from, people tell stories to make sense of their suffering. When they turn their disease, diseases into stories, they find healing. And healing, you know, in rare diseases, we rarely have cures. We often don't have treatments or therapies. But one can heal to make well and have spiritual, personal, emotional wellness uh, in the absence of improvement in symptoms or a cure to the disease. And that's really restoring health. So healing, health, wellness, uh, illness, right? a lot of these terms we use, sickness, we use interchangeably, but we just kind of want to get on the same page here. What Arthur Frank, who is a sociologist uh, from Yale University and, and a patient who experienced uh, illness through cancer, and he wrote and reflected on his experience. So a portion of his text that we want to focus on and kind of do a what we call a close read is his uh, concept of these different illness narratives, restitution, chaos, and quest. The restitution illness narrative, as uh, Dr. Frank, is one that we don't have a lot in rare disease. Anticipate getting uh, well. Now, we use the term well, that there is wellness, but being cured or having resolution. You know, you hurt your shoulder, doctor says, or you go to the doctor, it hurts when I do this. And the old joke, well, then don't do that. And then days or weeks later, you're back to baseline. You're cured either through time or some treatment, and you have restitution. That's something that we rarely in rare disease have. What is more often are these two other chaos and quest illness narratives. And we want to distinguish what Dr. Frank is talking about. 
he conceives and what narrative medicine conceives is that a person, a human being lives a narrative, lives a story. Your life and everything around you is a narrative and a story and you're a character. You're the main character in your life story. And when you're living this illness narrative, um, there's we use chaos and quest. And when we start looking at poems and writing poems as uh, poetry or a, a piece of uh, visual art is a snapshot in time. So we don't we want to be clear that when we look at a poem or talk about uh, you know tone and mood and other aspects of close reading of a particular piece of work is a little bit dip within, but uh, different than the broader term, what uh, Dr. Frank uh, describes is these illness narratives. So chaos, which uh, is used a lot by people with cro any chronic disease, rare or common, is where the illness seems to stretch on forever. Kind of takes over both your life and your identity. No respite, no, or the lack of redeeming insights. Person kind of loses insight. Everything becomes focused on the disease. It is what he describes as the anti-narrative of time without sequence. Is there they where an hour can seem like a year, sometimes two, three years pass, and it seems like it goes by in a minute. Telling without mediation and speaking about oneself without being fully able to reflect on oneself. And this is where we use art, poetry to do uh, reflective writing to help move towards from chaos towards quest by self-reflective uh, writing, which poetry is doing. So when Abby composes a poem and she's reflecting on herself, she's gaining, helping gain insight or redirecting, reordering insight into her experience, the disease, the illness, things around her, her suffering that then moves to a uh, quest. There's an element of quest. So when we achieve a quest illness narrative in our life, we find that it, insight where the illness is transformed as a means for the ill person to become and to take on someone new, where the illness is there, pains and all those things, uh, lack of treatment thing, and the disease often progresses and gets worse, but you're not consumed and identified and your identity is not taken over. So that's what we're meaning. So we're gonna use these chaos and quest illness narratives. It's very important to know when we talk about chaos, if we went through Abby's poem, when we're going through this, when we use chaos and kind of looking at this as a, a narrative type of thing, chaos is something that's brought on by the illness experience and internal and external factors. It's not something that the patient chooses. Abby doesn't choose to have chaos. None of us do. Um, so it's not that a chaos illness narrative is a bad thing. You're doing something wrong. We're just trying through advocacy and art itself is to go into the quest. And as noted here, this is common in our rare artists and advocacy. So next slide, please. We're gonna move along. So the two techniques that many are familiar, they're not unique to narrative medicine in literature. Uh, if you know any college students, high school students, they do close reading and reflective or creating creative writing. So when we close read a poem, um, we looked for the information conta contained within it, uh, ambiguities, complexity, texture, mood, or tone, and plot. And plot is the you know basically the storyline. We then can adapt uh, close reading to listening to spoken word. As Abby read her poem, we close listened to her. Uh, music and in visual art. When we look at the painting, is you or uh, the artwork from the rare artists there, they can be doing what's called a slow look where they analyze and use those close reading uh, prompts to really what is being conveyed, what's the story being conveyed in the piece of uh, art or the uh, poetry. And then it's not enough just to read or do the close reading where we get that attention that we spoke about we then need to bring representation where we, as Abby said, say the unsayable uh, to say out loud and speak things that go unsaid. And that's what we do through reflective writing, through prompt journal writing, and today we're gonna do poetry. So next slide, please. 
and we can get in to. So we're going to do a, as I read the poem, I want you to uh, close read, uh, particularly focused on, we're going to take in information, but focusing on the mood and tone, texture, think of the plot, the storyline, kind of those three things uh, to start out with. So I'm going to read this. In this uh, first poem called I Ain't Dead Yet is by Woody Guthrie, famed uh, iconic American folk singer, poet, artist. You can see his self-portrait uh, there in the middle. And Woody Guthrie, as you may or may not know, had Huntington, at the time it was called Huntington's Korea. It's now called Huntington's Disease. I like to lose the possessive and call it Huntington Disease, but um, so it's gone through some name changes, but the, the word Korea means to dance. You see the uh, other visual there called the Korea uh, dance. And this is a, they have a very rhythmic dance uh, type, what, what is looks like a dance, but it's a movement disorder. And so that's what Korea, a Korea form disorder that Huntington's is one type, but there's a lot of type of these. That's what that term Met. So Woody Guthrie was diagnosed in, uh, got his diagnosis in 1952, but had lived many years with it. His mother had it at the age of 14, but they didn't know it. She was uh, committed to a psychiatric hospital for the insane was the term. And Woody ultimately too was uh, uh, committed to psychiat multiple psychiatric hospitals. Uh, which fortunately through advocacy, we don't uh, forcibly commit uh, people to these uh, institutions. So the setting here is this poem and the tone and moods gonna seem dark. We're gonna see some elements of chaos narrative that can be a little bit concerning, but he's, this is one month after being uh, committed to an institution, a month or two after the formal diagnosis, but something that he has lived with. So as I read that, maybe you can put in the chat box some of the mood, tone, texture, ambiguities, plot. So as I read, the world, it's hit me in my face. It hit me over my head. It beat me black, blue, and green. But still, though, I ain't dead. 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 I ain't dead, folks. I ain't dead. I ain't dead. I stumble and I fall, I roll and crawl in thorny bushes, like I said. I'm all balled up and all falled up, but still, folks, I ain't dead. So as you're putting in the chat, I, you know, the mood, and particularly that middle section as we look to the kind of the three parts to this, where he starts out by really the world is physically assaulting him, black, blue, and green. And then he goes to this middle section, this repetition of stating I ain't dead, which is very, can be dark, but uh, can also be a form that he's expressing some hope that, hey, I haven't gone anywhere. I've been committed and locked behind these uh, institutional doors, but um, I'm still here. And then the last part where he actually describes some of the illness and disease uh, impact of this movement disorder where he's stumbling and falling and crawling. Um, so if we think about chaos, there's certainly a lot of elements of those chaos narratives, but there's also elements of quest uh, illness narratives. So as we go through in this, I'm just looking kind of at, the chat, we want to uh, think about both of these things. And at this point in time, this haiku, this is the time for you to introduce and start working on your poetry. So my reflective writing is I wrote this uh, haiku poem and reflective writing is something you can do in a couple of minutes. So I titled it Troubadour's Last Dance, dance reflective of the Korea troubadour that is a singer. I brought the, the disease and illness, the writhing movements untethered. In the second line, that he's a crooner for forgotten faces, a little ambiguity that he was a singer and a folk singer for the downtrodden and the forgotten ones, but also the second, uh, second meaning that as he developed dementia towards the end, that even those familiar to him were forgotten faces. 
I then brought an element of uh, a quest narrative of, of the hope uh, that he spoke of and wrote of as he was going through this disease and tied hope is your, Y-E-R, kind of the folk uh, singer as a partner, that his dance partner is hope. So kind of tied in sort of the uh, chaos and some quest elements and try to represent. So I would like to have you enter in the chat box. Uh, Haiku Poems is a 575 uh, syllable. So writhing on tethered is five syllables, not five words. Croons for Forgotten Faces is seven syllables. And hope is your partner's five syllables. So if you want to reflect on something with Huntington's disease or this particular poem and either alter, change your own mind, I don't take offense or compose your own. This is a form called haiku poetry. We're not going to, I'm just going to, that's our main uh, close read. I'm going to comment on uh, Bob Dylan, who was a friend uh, to their Bob Dylan uh, idolized and really made his career on Woody Guthrie. And they had a relationship and became a very uh, close friend and partner through his uh, disease process. And I wanted to bring kind of the caregiver, family members, friends that have a close affiliation and that Bob's uh, narrative, he doesn't have the disease or the illness, but he's somebody who's bearing witness to the loss of his idol and friend as he did, uh, deteriorates. And we're not going to read this, but you can note in the middle section, this and, 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 kind of that repetition of sort of the issues and problems of life that pile up one on another. And it kind of creates that element of uh, chaos to it. And this is only about a third. This is 263 words. So it's uh, Bob Dylan was asked to do in 25 words, what does Woody Guthrie mean to you? Well, he couldn't do it. It took five pages. This portion of it is very uh, steeped in, in sort of a what we would call sort of a chaos. But the overall mood is an analysis of hope, just like uh, Woody Guthrie had hope that the longer version of it, if you read it, really is hope. And you could say it's an ode to hope or an ode to Woody. Uh, and he spoke it in 1963 in New York City, four years before the death of Woody Guthrie, after visiting him in the one of the institutions. So um, another form, if you have brought in some haikus is a couplet. If you've read Romeo and Juliet or a lot of Shakespeare uses a lot of couplets, which is a two line poem. And if you're ready for the challenge of creating a couplet where the first line is devoted to the patient, the second line to the caregiver and or a first line to chaos and a second line to quest, kind of thinking of different ways we can compose a uh, couplet. So those are things you can enter into the chat box. And I'm gonna pause before you proceed onward. Any questions? Uh, do we have any submissions yet that we can share either haiku or a couplet to start? I know you just got the couplet assignment. Do we have a... Uh, stab at a haiku. If not, we can proceed on to there. I told uh, Stephanie and Abby and Caitlin that they have to uh, be our writers if we don't get some uh, submissions. But let's go on to the next slide if we don't have any questions uh, or comments. Carla, it looks like we just got uh, one from Annalise. Actually, we have a couple coming in. All right. Can you uh, choose one just so that we hear? So this is uh, representation. It's not enough to close read. We have to share and say the unsayable. So, Stephanie, why don't you pick a, a poem to uh, read and let's uh, close listen. Sure. Um, Annalise, I am going to read yours, um, which is a haiku. It says, I am beautiful, broken bent, still beautiful. See me. Please see me. Beautiful. Is there another one real 
quick that you want to read or we'll go on? Yeah, um, we just got another from Nell. Uh, this says, they see his bruises, his cries dissolve in the wind, but his embers glow. I love that. That that blends in very, in 17 syllables, very short order you bring in. It starts off kind of with the, with the mood or the tone can be sort of other, but it has that quest and hopeful um, quality to it. So if we can go on to the next slide, we're not going to do, the next slide is a different disease, but I just want to have the, it's something called an uh, I want to introduce the, the narrative of ultra rare, something called Job syndrome, which is hyperimmunoglobulin E. Um, and I say from chaos to quest. And I wanted to focus these people, where they get the uh, name Job syndrome is from the book of Job in the Old Testament. Uh, people who are from head to toe covered with, you know, for in the book of Job is boils and sores. But what these are, are skin abscesses and eczema or dermatologic breakdown. So one of the things about, is we compose lists of what are elements of chaos common to uh, rare disease? There's the isolation of being one or a few. Uh, there's the stigma of like with Woody Guthrie of mental health and being, uh, or disability, stigma of disability, uh, discrimination, are common uh, themes with genetic diseases such as Job syndrome. There's guilt from the parent or the one who transmitted a mu mu mutation. Then there's the patient. Why did I get this? How did I get this? Why me? And that's the book of Job. Why do uh, bad things happen to good people? And so just real quick, uh, it's kind of the close look process of we see Rembrandt and Job Plagas, if I'm pronouncing that Dutch word, uh, but it's really kind of the uh, uh, torment of the, the people around him are his three closest friends, his three BFFs. He kind of looks like a patient in a hospital where they gave him the drape sheet, but didn't uh, give him the gown. And these, uh, I, I see him as doctors kind of hovering around him. He says, he, but Plagas, is he really being tormented? Below is William Blake, where Job is rebuked by his friends. Those are those same three friends, but now you see rebuke. And I think he looks more tormented than Rembrandt's uh, Job, but that feeling of isolation, how can you be isolated when your three be best friends are around you? Well, sometimes people think you must have done something to have this disease process. And uh, a, a professor of uh, Hebrew, at uh, U UCLA, Robert Alter did the poetry of Job, wrote a book about it, and we're going to proceed on, but this is actually from uh, the book of Job, a uh, couple of passages which kind of express sort of that uh, chaos illnesses of, you know, I, why is this happening to me? I wish I was never born type things. So as we compose lists of things that contribute to chaos, now we want to think about how can we move to quests. So if we go on to the next uh, slide, these are our rare, a uh, couple rare artists, as I mentioned, the uh, Friedrichs Ataxia, uh, this one called uh, Stage Transition by uh, Sophia Sieber Davis. And when you're in advocacy, that approval of a Skyclaris is the name of the medication. It, it's not a cure, but something to slow the progress. And you see this beautiful uh, 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 painting that shows a tremendous ability. And then the accompanying text kind of references you know, some elements of things that we might think are, are chaos, but actually doing the work itself is a quest type activity and the description of her, the scene of a performer in the moments before their grand stage entrance. She then describes the acrylic paint, uh, painting on a small palette that's a four by six inch panel. And, you know, it, when you think of a taxi as a, uh, unlike the uh, choreoform movements, this is really a, a problem with coordination where one cannot walk or move the arms and the legs and even affects the speech, really whole body thing. So working on these small 
uh, spaces can help uh, someone like Sophia do the art and, pr and produce such beautiful works of art. And then she finds uh, one of my favorite subject matters are dancers, probably because I yearn for their physical grace, really getting home this uh, describing and sort of close reading and reflecting on her own uh, work. So using example of using paintings and artwork to uh, stimulate and find uh, purpose and uh, quest our narratives in the next if we go to the next slide, so we have time to, in pain to purpose, this is, and we've uh, heard from or saw a picture of Laura. In this, I really think if you look in close or slow look at the the visual, but I'm just going to quick read this, and then we're going to go to sort of your time to free form, uh, write some poetry and submit. I just want to read this aloud while you're working and submitting. Uh, your forms, whether haiku, couplets, uh, sonnets, 16 or 14 line, um, whatever you want to uh, work on. Ha but I'm going to having a rare disease impacts every aspect of my life. I lived with my symptoms for 18 years before I got an answer. Suddenly everything made sense. Knowing that the problem was in my DNA and not just in my head was incredibly validating something that I hope that every rare disease patient will get to experience. This piece depicts a DNA helix that forms a silhouette from my advocacy headshot, symbolizing the way that I have been shaped by the mutation in my genes, as well as the way that advocacy has given my pain a purpose. So Laura still has pain. She still is impacted by the rare disease, but really is living or exhibiting uh, the quest narrative. So next slide, please. This is writing to a prompt. And the prompt is, what is your rare disease lived experience? And whether you're doing a haiku or a couplet or a couple of couplets, a sonnet, a limerick, um, start uh, submitting and working. And hopefully these works of uh, art, other rare artists have stimulated you uh, in some way or fashion to uh start working on poetry so let's hear some poetry see some poetry in the last couple of minutes as you work and compose and submit because in order to have affiliation the ultimate goal is to uh bring that connection affiliation we need to make that connection so we need to hear say the unsayable of representation and then make that final connection so Stephanie and amazing. Thank you so much, Carl. I put a link in the chat um, from Dr. Barnes that includes different references to different types of poetry. I know we talked a lot today about different forms, including haiku. So feel free to reference that as you are coming up with poems. Um, I'm very impressed with the poems you all were able to come up with that quickly off the spot, on the spot. So in our last minute or so together, feel free to continue working on your poems and share them in the chat. Um, we'd love to hear. Um, but before you all head off and are still working on your poems, I'm going to pass it to Caitlin to give an opportunity to really use these poems. As we talked about when you're meeting with legislators, um, you can use these poems as part of your storytelling. Um, so Caitlin, I am going to pass it to you. And thank you, Stephanie. Hey, everybody. Um, I promise to be brief here. Uh, I just wanted to share this opportunity with you all. Um, if you haven't not heard of Rare Across America before, um, Rare Across America is an event uh, that RDLA hosts. Um, this year, it is going to be August 17th through 18th, and it's the opportunity to meet with your members of Congress at their in-district offices. Um, so each member of Congress has an office in D.C. as well as an office or multiple offices uh, in their respective districts and states. Um, so for Rare Across America this year, you will be able to meet in person um, with your member of the House of Representatives at those in-state and district offices. And then we will be holding Senate meetings virtually. Um, so we will not have any in-person Senate meetings. So if you um, are interested in participating but don't want to travel 100%, uh, we hope you still join us for the virtual Senate meetings. Um, 
We'll also have trainings leading up to this, um, trainings on how to share your story, trainings on what you can expect in your meetings, and uh, we'll walk through a couple different asks that you can uh, choose to make during your meetings. Um, so we'll make sure everybody is prepared and feels good going into their meetings. Um, so we hope that you all will join us. Uh, just be sure to register before July 11th if you are interested in joining. Um, and like Stephanie said, this is a great opportunity to share your poetry with your members of the Congress. Um, you know, when we're in meetings with rare artists and they share their art, um, I feel like it's it just, leaves a different impact. Um, and so uh, we hope that you guys will join us and share your art, share your poetry, um, all the beautiful things you create uh, to help share your story. And if you have any questions about Rare Across America, you can email me. I'll drop my email in the chat for you all. Amazing. Thank you so much, Caitlin. We hope to see many of you at Rare Across America with your poems. Honestly, if you came up with poems that quickly, I am so excited to see what you come up with when you have more time. Um, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for making Rare Artists possible. Uh, we are going to hang on probably for about three or so minutes. I would love to hear um, if anybody has created any more poems in our time together, or if anybody has any questions for Dr. Barnes, Caitlin, or myself, feel free to put them in the chat. Like I said, we'll hang on for a couple minutes for people to share any poems that they have come up with, but um, this webinar was recorded and it will be posted on uh, the Rare Artist website. Feel free to email me at rareartist at everylifefoundation.org if you have any questions. I'm happy to work with you as you're working on your poetry. Um, just a quick plug, if you don't follow us on social media, please make sure that you follow Rare Artist on Instagram or RDLA, which is Rare Advocates on Instagram. And we are also on Facebook. Um, like I said, feel free to pop any questions, poems in the chat for the last couple minutes, but thank you all for joining us today. Uh, well, sorry, I didn't leave enough, enough nope. time to uh, have a little longer writing, uh, but I think we got, I, these are great poems that I'm reading. Oh, we just got another poem from Nell. I'm fine, I tell them. I can go with them but their laughter is already out the window where ice crystals creep up the window pane, bearing my escape. Oh, now that's incredible. It's amazing. Someday writing in a short period of time, you, it stimulates and hopefully <laughs> that these, you know, despite my blabbing, that's that the rare artists, the examples that, that, that kind of stimulates you as you're close reading and doing that, those processes of some other work that it, it it triggers and stimulates the thought process, or at least that's the uh, intent of it. It's nice to see someone going beyond haiku and couplets. I uh, saved the chat too. These are great. I think um, if Annalise is still on here, now still on here if any of you are comfortable with us sharing it on our website as kind of examples i would love to be able to spotlight these poems that you all are sharing all right my friends i'm going to have one more minute for any last calls for anybody to share their poems in the chat but it is not a last call in general because don't forget rare artists will open up on july 23rd um surprise dr barnes is going to be one of the judges for rare artist for uh, poetry so um he is very excited to review all the art pieces and poetry pieces as well can i read one aloud that i'm seeing here Let's Absolutely. Fear of the unknown. Faith carries you through darkness. Just take a breath. 
breathe. Beautiful. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. You can say a lot in 17 syllables. Look into my eyes. My life still lives within them, reflecting outward. Grieving in the pain, searching for relief from this. I found peace and hope. Great. They see his, bru I think we had, they see his bruises, his cries dissolve in the wind, but his embers glow. I think we did. These are great. This is gonna be hard to judge this. How do you? <laughs> I know. So, That's why I'm having I'm not a judge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friends, thank you all again for joining us today. The uh, recording will be posted and um, feel free to reach out if you need anything. But again, thanks for joining and enjoy the rest of your day.